Well, hello there. I've had a few false starts before recording this podcast. The lawnmowers are everywhere today. It's a Saturday. Uh, little known fact to those um, outside LA, but when you're shooting here in LA and uh, people start noticing, the lawnmowers come out and then you have to pay them to keep quiet. The last rate, I think, was 300 bucks to get them to stop. This happens very often. Anyway. A few people have been asking me if I've seen the uh, series Stolen Youth. I have not. I have a resistance to seeing it. I'm sure it's brilliant. People have said extraordinary things about it. I think it's just uh, so close to home and I'm sure it'll be traumatizing. Also right now I'm shooting two projects that are the same kinds of things. Uh, They're pretty traumatizing as well. So I think I'm gonna wait a bit. Um, Not quite ready to watch it, but I'm hearing incredible things about it. Today, I want to talk about one of the level twos in Nixium. So there were two kinds of curriculum. There was level one, which was like the 16 day that everybody came to take. And then there was the level two curriculum, which is supposedly much deeper. Now, during the level one curriculum, I was a complete asshole. I was constantly saying, yeah, well, that's simplistic. That's oversimplified. That's not quite how it works. Um, And the answer they kept on giving me was wait until level two, wait until level two, wait until level two, you know, and the sort of idea was, you know, yeah, yeah, we know you're the what the bleep guy, but like wait until level two. So I was very excited about the level two curriculum. And when I once I finally got into doing it, I was that some of it was pretty amazing. And there was one uh, intensive in particular that had a module in it that blew me away. There was an intensive called level two B. It was breaches of ethics. That is a very loud weed whacker. You know what? I'm just going to keep going. So breaches of ethics uh, was about ethical breaches. You know, human beings choosing body over ideology. So I had to stop for a leaf blower and I watched the guy for a while blow leaves out from against the curb and under cars into the street where then cars would drive past and blow all the leaves back against the curb again. Yeah. I don't get it. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result? Anyway, leaf blowers. All right, back to level twos. So breaches of ethics was about exploring the way that you gave up your principles and ideology for comfort, for satiation. It was it was a lot more complex than that, but that's basically what it was. And in this one particular um, module in level 2B, there was one which I thought was called the hypothesis of God. But when I looked very carefully at the notes, it turns out it wasn't called that. Maybe they just, you know, said that sort of offhandedly, but that's what I thought it was for many years. And the the hypothesis of God was really fascinating. So the way these these intensives worked, you know, is is um, we had to break out and discuss a lot of questions. And this particular question set was about trying to get, they were trying to get us to imagine what it was like being a baby. In essence, they were trying to have us feel that sort of existential isolation. And as you come to conscious awareness, you realize there's something out there. That was the basic idea. So, you know, we do these question sets for hours and hours and hours, and then the debrief comes. And I'm going to read you the, the, the debrief, because it was fascinating. Now, it's written horribly. I, I don't think they ever, I think they just wrote it down verbatim based on what, you know, the great Vanguard said. And then uh, I don't think they ever changed it because it was sort of like the, the you know, the, the holy writ, the, the, the Bible. They couldn't change a single word. So it's horribly written. So I'm going to stumble through it. But here's basically what the debrief said. This is after we're exploring, you know, what it's like being a baby, what it's like sort of coming to awareness, what's out there, you know, the different feelings we're having. Are we having any thoughts at all? So this was read by, I think, I believe Nancy Salzman um, taught my level to be, I think. I'm, I'm not sure. So here it is. The baby first experiences what we might imagine as chaos. Different sensations and feelings no real distinction between external and internal, but there arises patterns. See what I meant about bad writing? The body has natural patterns. The environment has natural patterns. Hunger arises. The filling of the bladder arises. 
all these different events that go on. The baby starts to connect the patterns together, cause and effect. We are cause and effect programmable machines. We were always told that, by the way, constantly. We're basically robots. There are things for survival, a primitive urge of expression, even with breathing, breathing louder, of making a noise, the feeling of making a noise, the vibration in the chest. There is a certain learning that goes on when the baby cries, that it can control the noise. It can be louder. It can go on. It can stop. It can go on again. It's not like the baby thinks, neat, I can do this. It's not at that cognitive level. There is this real experience of cause and effect, and in particular, that baby is causing. Then there is a strange thing that happens. There is an organization to the outside world and the baby, and there is an org organizing principle. Ah, the leaf blower is back. Never mind, we keep going. The baby is handled. The baby is moved when the mother or father lifts the baby. There is a directedness about that. There is a sort of a patterned feeling, a certain type of security. There are different types of people that hold the baby. The baby can tell the difference. Even a small infant can tell the difference when one or another person is holding it. In the nature of the way the holding feels, it's what feels better than the other. What may become apparent more and more from the most unconscious realms of the baby as the baby goes into more cognitive awareness, more awareness, is that there is something afoot. First, the baby doesn't have vision, so it's in the dark, but there are outside forces acting upon the baby. It is one thing to be in the crib and to try to roll over to scream or to feel the blanket, but then there is another thing about a force acting upon. Lifting, moving, things like that, and at first it is not distinguishable. It becomes distinguishable because as adults, we certainly can distinguish. There is an outside force that provides comfort, warmth, holding, food, etc. When something is uncomfortable, something comes and takes care of it. It is an experience, a discovery, not an intellectual thing, not a cognitive awareness. Do you know what it is like when you are expecting something to happen? Like the music in a movie. You hear it once, the bad thing happens, and now you know what it means, although you don't think about it. There is something out there. From the very first moments of birth throughout, there develops a sense that there is something out there, and there is a lot of data that there is something out there. A sense develops, and data tells us it's there, and by the time we can see, it is already well formed. There is something out there. It is the most rudimentary form of expectation. We see there are these gods, these adults that take care of us. But that impulse is already well formed before we open our eyes. It is pre-vision. There is a vague notion of something, and maybe it is not as profound with all people. With some, it is very profound. A lot of people walk around, and there is just a feeling that there is something more. There is something more, something out there, some intelligence in the universe. It is an exact metaphor for the baby with the eyes closed. The adult looking around and they're blinded by the realness of the table in the room, but there is something beyond it. Just like when your eyes were closed, there was something beyond it. It is a base impulse, a feeling of incompletion, waiting for completion, and God is that completion. The baby crying out for help in the dark for God. They learn that God comes for them. So, wow, that leaf blower is going for it. So this, this blew me away because I had this thought for the first time. Oh, well, what if there's uh, this God impulse? What if there's a somatic explanation for it? You know, what if my whole life I've been thinking that there was some force out there, some God out there, um, something out there? What if it was all just early, you know, infant programming? And it kind of blew me away. And I think this was Ranieri's attempt to deprogram us from mysticism. You see, he was constantly trying to get us to, so he said, to get us to look at, to be reality-based, to look at reality. What is clear, measurable cause and effect? And anything that's not that, you have to categorize as something other 
but it's not necessarily reality. And he wanted to get us away from um, thinking that there was stuff out there, you know, away from the new age, away from, from mysticism. And in fact, there were a lot of people that came in who were very mystical like myself, and he made it his mission to deprogram us. So this was one of the things I think he used. Um, there's, there's something dark about this particular intensive, though. What he was doing is he was pushing people into this somatic existential experience. He was pushing them into an existential crisis, asking questions like, what if you're utterly alone? You know, what if you are utterly, utterly alone? Now, I do see some benefit in these kinds of thought somatic experiments, you know, to, to imagine one being oneself being completely alone, no longer reaching out there for an answer. But what he did was basically push us into this existential crisis of deep aloneness. But who was always there was the head trainer, the curriculum, the prefect, the vanguard. So putting us into crisis, there was something to hold on to, which was them. Because they would never really say, well, you can't hold on uh, to us either. Because the whole idea was to transfer our mysticism from what we believed when we came in to them. That was the idea. And this was a trick. This was a trick to get us to, in essence, on a very deep level, worship them instead of whatever ideas we were worshiping or, or notion, mystical notions we had. So this really, really blew my mind. And I walked around this for years. In fact, you know, this was probably when I did this intensive, it was probably 2005. You know, it's now 2023. I've been thinking about it all these years. But what I've been thinking about is how this applies to other things. This... This hypothesis that, that he was talking about, which I don't know if it was original, and I'm sure, and I hope somebody out there who studied philosophy can actually tell me like where this actually came from because I, I doubt it came from him. But it got me thinking, it, could, it be, could this explain why many people have this, this built-in blind belief in authority figures? Almost like it's programmed into them. And by the way, I believe Ranieri understood this very, very well. Not only because of this module, but what there was a reason that he wanted the modules on video. There was a reason that he wanted Nancy Salzman on video because he understood that seeing somebody on television did something to your psyche. It gave them this, this sort of air of authority, larger than life kind of feeling you had about them. And you believed in them and you believed it must be true. And he understood that. Um, he said that it actually elevated her and caused people to automatically believe because she is this celebrity-like figure on the television. Um, and, and that is what happened. You know, many people, including myself, saw her larger than life, even though, you know, I spent a lot of time with her in person, watching her on television did have that effect. And I keep on wondering, does this go back to this sort of this God impulse and, and this, this potential explanation for where that God impulse comes from? When I was a child, I remember my grandparents watching the news. And I, and I think I've mentioned before that news, uh, sorry, television came to South Africa very late. I think it was 1970, um, maybe seven or eight. I don't remember exactly. And, you know, my grandparents, my grandfather especially, would watch the news every single night. And my sense was that what he was watching was the truth. And the way he talked about the news, like whatever the news said, he would then discuss it as though that was the truth, that was the, the, the word of God, um, not to be questioned. Now, of course, I find out later, you know, as I got to university and as I began to understand how corrupt the government was, that it was just government-sponsored and, and completely controlled propaganda. Uh, much of it was just complete lies. This gets me to the world at large. It's possible that we may have something really unfortunate in our programming because we watch the news today, modern day life. We watch the news and somewhere deep inside of us, we might have this feeling that they on the screen outside of us are larger than life and that they have our best interests at heart. Our leaders surely love us, don't they? 
And my question is, do they? You see, one thing I understand about abusers is abusers infantilize us. And what's weird is we go along with it. Um, and our leaders are very willing to treat us as children. They're completely willing to see us as children, treat us like children, think of us as children. But we're very willing to treat them like some kind of weird parent, like the all-knowing, all-wise parent. It's like we haven't grown up. We believe our institutions. We believe our politicians um, and our news anchors, even though rationally, rationally, we understand that they obey corporate interests. The news is corporate interests. They obey their own gods. Now, even me saying this might engender anger because we must protect our gods at all costs. And we must vilify whoever is asking these childish and potentially conspiratorial questions. Because if our gods are corrupt, then we are alone and completely bereft. And we, so we must protect against any kind of personal existential crisis at all costs. Just think about it. You know, before you, you rage against the idea and rage against me, just think about it. Is it possible, if this, this, that particular module is accurate, I don't know if it is. And I really, as I said, I'd love to know from people that have a deeper understanding than I about these things, this, this story, this idea, this, this biological story of a potential God impulse. But is that what's going on? This thing where we abdicate our own sense of responsibility and power and, and defer to authority, defer to the outside. Um, is that where this comes from? I'm really curious about what you all think because this certainly blew things away for me. Now, just so you know, he never completely um, deprogrammed me from these ideas because my sense was always, even though it's possible that there is this God impulse, my sense has always been that there is something something else, something beyond perception. But again, I can't say that it's not just all this biological stuff. I don't know for sure. But my sense is, is there's something, and of course this is a very, this is a very circular kind of thinking. But, but let me know what you think. I am really, really curious what your thoughts are. We will talk soon.